Amen. We groan in this earthly tent because of the burdens of life in verse 4. Oh, how familiar Paul was with the burdens of life. How we have become accustomed to that hardship as well. We have to contend with the problems of making a living, the problems of sickness and pain and temptation. This life is hard, but we're looking forward to an unseen life in heaven. Paul says we, gro we groan to be clothed, not with mortal suffering, but to put on the immortality of heaven where there is no suffering, no crying, sighing, or dying, as someone once said. Let me ask you a question. Is that what you're longing for? In verses 1 through 4, Paul talks about a tent that is temporary. But in verse 5, he talks about a transaction that is permanent. The one who made us, the one who fashioned us for heaven has given us his spirit as a deposit, as a guarantee of what is to come. Amen. Amen. You see, friend, God wants all men to be saved, to live into heaven. God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to Him through repentance. 2 Peter 3 and 9. But God sets the terms of salvation. And everyone who meets those terms who obey those terms, has a dwelling place in heaven. Amen? Amen? We have a covenant relationship. Anyone wanting to go to heaven must believe and repent, confess, be baptized, and remain faithful unto death. That is the plan. That is the plan that we talk about every Lord's Day. That's the plan that I talked about for 52 Sundays Actually, 50. Let's see. 49. I was gone three weeks. Every Sunday, the call goes out for this transaction. And everyone who meets those term, terms will have a place in heaven. Eternal life comes to believers by way of a covenant. God has promised that we do, do those things, we'll be in heaven. We accept this transaction of forgiveness by faith, by trusting God. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Born of His Spirit, with life from above, into God's family divine, justified through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when I as a sinner I came took of the offer of grace he did proffer, he saved me, hope, praise, his dear name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Everyone who has been born again has been given the deposit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul tells us in verse 5. This deposit of the Spirit is our guarantee of a heavenly home. You know, when you agree to purchase a home, the seller asks you to put down earnest money. It is a deposit that tells the uh, seller that you're serious, that you mean business, and that is a promise that you will pay the rest. Amen. Amen. And God says that the Holy Spirit is a deposit. He gives us confidence while we are in this body and absent from the Lord. As Paul says in verse 6. While on earth He enables us to walk by faith and not by sight. We trust in His leading through the Holy Spirit. He is there to guide us through this life. He is our companion, our comforter as we journey to the promised land, as it were. He is with us to guide us in every circumstance of life. 
If we look back to chapter 4, Paul says, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. <coughs> Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Isn't God good? All the time. All the time. Amen, amen. Even though we have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives right now, Paul says he would rather to be absent to the body and present with the Lord. He said, if I had my brothers, I'd go to heaven today. You see, friend, when a Christian dies, his body is buried and returns to the elements from which it came. But his spirit goes immediately into the presence of the Lord in heaven. Oh, what a wonderful promise. Listen, there is no intermediate place for souls of men after death. To be absent from the body is to be present in heaven or in hell. We don't often talk about that, but that's true. You must decide before you die. Paul says that's why we labor, whether present or absent, to be accepted by Him, to live a life worthy of our calling. In verse 9, let me ask you a question. How can we be acceptable to Him? Why, why? We'll keep the Ten Commandments, that's what we'll do. Why, we, why we'll keep the golden rule, that's what we'll do. Is there any work that I can do to make me acceptable to Him? And the answer is a resounding no. Listen to what Paul writes in Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we believe in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no man be justified. After we accept Him, or after our acceptance of Him by faith in Jesus Christ, we labor to remain faithful to Him. Amen? Amen. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I wonder, friend, is that one of your new years Resolutions. Paul talks about a tent that is temporary. He talks about a transaction that is permanent. And now he talks about a trial that is coming. In verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat. Listen, there is a day of judgment coming when God will set things aright. Nobody knows what that day will be. But we know it will come because we have God's Word on it. Amen. Amen? Amen. Paul teaches, or Peter teaches in chapter 3 of his second epistle, he says, the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And we find that Acts 17.31 says, He hath pointed a day in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained. And he goes on to say that the resurrected one, Jesus Christ, that is the one who will sit on the judgment seat. And I'm glad he's there. Amen. What fair judge of men could there be? Jesus Christ who lived and was tempted in all points like as we are and yet without sin. He knows all the pressures of life. He knows the intents and motives of every heart. He is God. He is God-man. No one can say to him on that day, I didn't get a fair trial. You didn't know my circumstances. You didn't walk in my shoes because he did. Who will appear before this judgment seat of Christ? The text says all. 
All must appear. All mankind, no matter what sex, color, or nationality, no matter how rich or poor, how prominent or how obscure, all will appear. <coughs> Paul looked forward to that day of judgment. As he writes a young preacher named Timothy, he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them who love His appearing. Are you looking forward to that day? Are you ready to be judged? On the day Paul is talking about, Jesus will say to every Christian, Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. That's what the Christian will hear. Oh, what a day of rejoicing that will be. But not all will <laughs> rejoice. Some will hear Jesus say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye cursed unto everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. A tent that's temporary. He talks about a transaction that is permanent. He talks about a trial that is coming. And he talks about the terror of the Lord. I don't need to spend much time on this Jesus told us not to fear Him that could only destroy the body, but fear Him that could destroy both body and soul in hell. Because Paul knows the terror of the Lord. To all those who reject God's Son, who reject His plan, Paul blows the trumpet he sounds the alarm once again. The trumpet of salvation to persuade men. You see, that is the mission of the church. To persuade men there is coming a day that you will be accountable for. Are you ready to meet that day? You see, friend, now is the accepted time. Today <coughs> is the day of salvation. You might not have all year to get right with God. Don't you want to go to heaven? <laughs> 